According to the latest census figures, most of the United Kingdom population no longer declare themselves to be Christian. Only 46% do so. And that, of course, is Christian in a very loose sense of the name. 37% said they had no religious affiliation at all. While every major religion actually did show an increase in adherence with the exception of Christianity. Truly today's United Kingdom can be said to constitute a post-Christian society. And we in Northern Ireland, you know, we always sort of lag behind the UK mainland. But we know that the direction of travel is the same. We now live in a multicultural society and people of alternative religions or no religion at all represent our closest neighbours. Over a number of studies, seven in total, including this morning's, we're going to look at the ministry of one of the greatest biblical prophets, namely Elijah. And the context in which Elijah ministered does bear some similarity with our contemporary culture. Not that religion itself was on the wane in Elijah's day, for Israel as an ancient culture was suffused with religion and superstition. But as we shall see, Israel had become a thoroughly polytheistic uh, nation with the worship of pagan deities having to a large extent supplanted the worship of Yahweh, the true God. Israel was now given over to idolatry with only a small remnant of true believers. And God was going to visit judgment upon the nation and Elijah was to be his chosen instrument for effecting this divine punishment upon his rebellious people. This morning then we're going to be introduced to three individuals. First, the terrible twosome of Ahab and Jezebel, and then Elijah himself. And what I propose to do is to break up our reading into two sections. So we're going to begin by reading 1 Kings chapter 16, uh, really from verse 29 to the end of that chapter, uh, 29 to 34. And then subsequently, we'll read the first six verses of the following chapter. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, son of Omri, became king of Israel. And he reigned in Samaria over Israel 22 years. Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, but he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah pole and did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than did all the kings of Israel before him. In Ahab's time, Hiel of Bethel rebuilt Jericho. He laid its foundations at the cost of his firstborn son, Abiram, and he set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Sagob, in accordance with the word of the Lord spoken by Joshua, son of Nun. So meet 
King Ahab and his less than honorable wife, Jezebel. Actually, before commenting on this royal couple, whom uh, are labeled by Kent Hughes as the Lord and Lady of Darkness, we first need to paint a little bit of background. The period that we're going to be studying in this series is known as the Time of the Kings. After the death of Solomon, Israel had split between the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, which became known then as the Southern Kingdom, and the other 10 tribes, which became known as, you guessed it, the Northern Kingdom. The first ruler then of the Northern Kingdom was Jeroboam. Jeroboam was concerned that at festival times, his people would want to travel south to Jerusalem into the southern kingdom in order to attend the temple services. And so he had erected two alternative shrines. One of them was in Dan, in the northernmost part of the northern kingdom, and the other was at Beersheba, in the southernmost part of the northern kingdom. That these shrines consisted of golden calves was a rather poor choice given Israel's history with the golden calf when, you know, when Moses was up the mountain receiving the law. It was not really that Jeroboam was wishing to introduce worship of other deities, but by establishing rival shrines consisting of these golden calves. Jeroboam had offended the prescribed order for the worship of Yahweh. Yahweh was not to be worshipped through these means. Jeroboam was then succeeded by five kings who were told all did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Before then, Ahab took the reins of power. So this is nearly six decades after the division of the nation into the two kingdoms. And as our text tells us, Ahab did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. And we're told again about how he provoked the Lord more than any of his predecessors. You see, Ahab went beyond the sins of his predecessors with their false system of worshipping Yahweh, the sins of Jeroboam referred to in verse 31. He introduced the overt worship of foreign deities like the Phoenician god Baal and the Hittite goddess Asherah. Worship became explicitly synchronistic. That is to say, Yahweh was now only one of several deities who were worshipped. And indeed, Yahweh increasingly took second place behind these other deities. In particular, Baal was worshipped, for Baal was considered to be the god of fertility, a storm god, who controlled the sky. And for an agricultural society, good weather and especially abundant rain at just the right season was supremely important for crop yields and thus for the economy. We are told that Ahab set up an altar to Baal in the temple of Baal that he had built in Samaria, Samaria being the capital city of the northern kingdom. He also made an Asherah pole. Asherah was a female Canaanite deity associated very much with sex and reproduction. And thus religious prostitutes would be found at her shrines, as indeed was also the case with those shrines dedicated to the worship of Baal. How was it that Israel, 
or to be more precise, the northern kingdom for, for Judah, the southern kingdom, didn't fall so badly uh, in this respect. You know, that they, they kept up at least a formal allegiance to Yahweh. How was it that Israel had degenerated to this extent? Well, the answer is to do with marriage. Some of you may think that marriage is a common source of problems, but I cannot possibly comment upon that uh, knowing nothing about it. Ahab had married Jezebel, and this was the era when a political alliance with another state was often cemented by a marriage between members of their respective royal households. And Ahab had married the daughter of the king of Sidon, whose name gives away his religious affiliation, Eth Baal, Eth Baal. Indeed, Jezebel's home city of Jezreel was considered to be the epicenter of Baal worship. And Jezebel's name actually means Baal is the prince. Jezebel was a thoroughly wicked queen. Even today, her name is synonymous with evil. And of course, Jesus associated Jezebel with sexual immorality and religious defilement in his message to the church at Tharatara, found in Revelation chapter 2. Jezebel was determined that Baalism would replace any lingering worship of Yahweh. As we'll see on a subsequent occasion, she had the prophets of Yahweh killed while she surrounded herself with the prophets of Baal in her personal court of advisors. And Ahab, who comes across as a weak man, went along with her plans. He too, we're told, began to serve Baal and worship him. Israel thus departed from the ways of the Lord. And further evidence of apostasy was that Ahab allowed Hael of Bethel to rebuild Jericho in what constituted a flagrant defiance of the solemn oath uttered by Joshua upon the destruction of of Jericho, that it should never be rebuilt. Not even the death of Hael's sons, in accordance with Joshua's divinely mandated curse, would cause Ahab to have second thoughts over the perverse direction Jezebel and he were steering the nation. So let's turn then to our second reading. So we're into the the following chapter. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe and Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kareth ravine, east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have ordered the ravens to feed you there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kareth ravine, east of the Jordan, and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. So now, meet Elijah. Actually, Elijah's introduction to the scene is very abrupt. Roger Ellsworth writes, Elijah is the man without a resume. Or, as we in the United Kingdom would say, the man without a CV. We're told nothing explicit regarding his parentage. All we're told is that he was a Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead. Tishbe was a small hamlet 
in the hills of Gilead, an area east of the Jordan River. He was likely from the tribe of Manasseh or Gad, since it was these two tribes who occupied this area. Gilead was hill country, and many of the commentators speculate then that Elijah would likely have been strong and rugged, a bit like our Reuben. He were told that he was used to the rigors of outdoor life, maybe not so much like Reuben. And later on, we're told that he, he dressed in a cloak of camel's hair, which is certainly like Reuben. Elijah was a convinced believer in Yahweh. Indeed, his name means my God is Jehovah, which in turn would strongly suggest that Elijah's parents were believers. And of course, he introduces himself to Ahab with the words, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, verse 1. And later on, in 1 Kings 19, verse 10, Elijah will exclaim, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. Elijah shows tremendous courage as he confronts Israel's apostate monarch. He hits him with a severe and extremely bold message. There will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. In fact, reconciling the account in 1 Kings with what James writes in the New Testament regarding Elijah's prayer, James 5 verse 17, it would appear that by the time Elijah approached Ahab with this message from the Lord, the drought had already been six months in operation. But this drought was not going to end anytime soon. Indeed, it would last another full three years. And what we must understand is that this was a divinely sanctioned punishment of which the nation of Israel had been forewarned. If you turn back in your Bible to Deuteronomy chapter 11, and verses 13 to 17. This is what we find. So if you faithfully obey the commands I am giving you today, to love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul, then I will send rain on your land in its season, both autumn and spring rains, so that you may gather in your grain, new wine and oil. I will provide grass in the fields for your cattle, and you will eat and be satisfied. Be careful, or you will be enticed to turn away and worship other gods and bow down to them. Then the Lord's anger will burn against you, and he will shut the heavens so that it will not rain, and the ground will yield no produce and you will soon perish from the good land the Lord is giving you. Ahab was without excuse. Israel was without excuse. They had been forewarned. They ought to have known the score. And remember, Israel was an agrarian economy, so a drought of this magnitude would cause mass starvation and a multitude of deaths. And Elijah was chosen to be the Lord's messenger of doom. Elijah then receives another message from the Lord. Leave here, turn eastward and hide in the Kareth ravine east of the Jordan. In other words, scram, flee, get out. Obviously, Elijah's own life was in danger. Indeed, later we're told through Obadiah. That is not the book of Obadiah, which coincidentally we'll be studying in 2024 DV in Castlereagh Fellowship. 
but a different Obadiah, the Obadiah that we're going to meet in 1 Kings chapter 19. And we're told there that Ahab would launch a manhunt for Elijah, no doubt with the intention of ending his life as punishment for the drought which Ahab laid at um, Elijah's door. The Lord, however, assures Elijah that at the Kerith ravine, he'll be sustained by water from a brook and miraculously by ravens, bringing him daily rations of sun-blessed finest bread accompanied by some carrion. And that is what happened. Elijah bolts it to Kerith out of Ahab's sight and sure enough, the brook and the birds provide sufficient nourishment for Elijah, even as the land of Israel wilts from its lack of moisture. Now, as with all talks in this series, or indeed any series, I want to then tease out a couple of lessons, things that we can learn and apply to ourselves as Christians living in 21st century Belfast and beyond. Number one, the Lord God is sovereign over nature. Baal did not control Israel's weather system. Yahweh did. The Lord had forewarned Israel of what would happen should they embrace the worship of false deities. And that is why there was no rain for three and a half years. And the Lord God could command even the ravens to bring food to his servant. And what makes this perhaps even more remarkable is that as birds of prey, for ravens to carry food to Elijah was very much contrary to their own nature. Um, Joel Beakey, and I couldn't but laugh, at the name Joel Beakey. I thought it was a very fitting commentator when we're talking about ravens and birds. But Joel Beakey comments that ravens were known to sometimes to refuse to feed even their own young. Yet here, their flight schedule involves daily flyovers to Kareth to keep Elijah from dying of starvation. Moreover, it's not lost on the commentators that ravens were considered to be an unclean species. Yet Yahweh chooses to use such birds to perform his will, showing, you, showing us that he is the right to override all. He is the sovereign Lord. And he is still sovereign over nature today. Rain, sun, hail, snow, hurricanes, droughts, tsunamis, earthquakes, climate change, all are under his reign. And God can use whatever and whoever he wants to serve his purposes, whether it be friend or foe. Nothing lies outside Yahweh's purview. He is sovereign over nature. And the second of the two lessons for today is the importance of good leaders. Ahab was not just any individual. He was the king of Israel. And as such, he had a representative function. He was to lead the people of God, but he was an abject failure. Dominated by his wicked consort, he led Israel further down the road of idolatry and his disobedience brought divine visitation by way of drought and famine. In stark contrast, Elijah was a man of God who was obedient to his calling to take the message of judgment right into the king's court. And through his ministry, Elijah would lead the people of Israel, if only for a limited period of time, to acknowledge 
that Yahweh was indeed the only true God. Today, we need to pray for good and godly leaders. That, of course, is paramount within the church context, but also beyond. Whilst today we live in a democracy and not a theocracy like Israel of old, it's right that we pray for Christians of genuine commitment to be raised up to assume leadership roles in the state. They may not be welcomed. Think of the avalanche of abuse faced some months back by Kate Forbes for her evangelical Christian views when she stood for the leadership of the SNP. And might I say how badly Scotland, which some people describe not merely as the most secular part of the UK, but maybe the most liberal state in Europe, how badly Scotland could use such a leader. And here in Northern Ireland, we need to uphold in prayer those leaders who stand up for biblical truth in what is now an increasingly hostile post-Christian environment. And we need to pray that others, especially those who can defend Christian beliefs and the Christian worldview in a convincing and winsome way, are elected and use their influence for good. Of course, that will mean that they will have to be prepared to say things that are unpopular and countercultural. Just as Elijah's message was not what the people, not what the king nor the people of his day wanted to hear. And we, we need to pray as well for leaders of other faiths or indeed of no religious affiliation at all, that they do not take us further adrift from the ways of God and the, you know, the laws that they promulgate and thereby provoke his wrath and judgment. The tide of secularism and pluralism is strong. We do live in a changed environment in a truly post-Christian society. But you and I are called upon to resist this tide, to stand up for absolute truth and for absolute Christian morality, and to pray for national repentance from the path of apostasy. Let us then, in Castlereagh Fellowship and beyond, be people of bold faith, confident that our God sits on the throne and that his ways will prevail in the end. Amen.